Today we're hanging out with dinosaurs, wizards, and the most famous plumbers in the world as we uncover secrets here at Universal Studios Hollywood. Hello from the West Coast, ma'am fam, and welcome to Universal Studios Hollywood as we continue with our Best Kept Secret series. This is the series where we enjoy the theme parks and show the little details, the Easter eggs, the tiny little secrets that make these theme parks so incredibly immersive. I've not shot this here. A lot of these secrets I have not actually personally seen. I've done a lot of research. We're also gonna just spend time in the park today seeing what we can uncover on our own. I'm super excited. I have a great time every time I come to this park, so let's get in there. Before we even get into the park, however, let's talk a little bit about the park history. Did you know that Universal Studios Hollywood is older than all of Walt Disney World? In fact, as a theme park, it's only nine years younger than Disneyland, opening up in 1964. Disneyland opened in 1955. However, as a movie studio, it's much older than that, opening up in 1915. Universal Studios founder Carl Lemley bought a bunch of farmland in Hollywood and again opened this up as a movie studio in 1915. But what he did was actually pretty groundbreaking because he not only opened it as a movie studio to make movies on, he invited guests to come in. At the grand opening of the movie lot on March 14th, 1915, 10,000 people were in attendance as they were able to tour the production lot. In fact, he continued to later invite the general public where you could come in for just five cents. And with that five cents, you also got a fried chicken lunch. Can you even imagine that today? Uh, and then there was also the chance you could buy fresh fruit and produce from farmers nearby because this was all farmland beyond the movie studio. Eventually that had to shut down in 1930 because they weren't unable to soundproof the movie areas and the noise of the crowds would seep into the production. However, they were able to reopen this as a theme park officially in 1964, where they only had one attraction, the studio backlot. But isn't that amazing that this is a, essentially a theme park experience that dates way back before Disneyland, before Walt Disney World. You had Carl Lemley giving out tours and fried chicken to people who wanted to see how movies were made. And you can still go on that movie tour today. We're definitely gonna go. It's one of my favorite things about coming to Universal Studios Hollywood because you actually go on the back lot and see where they've made some of the most famous movies in history, including all those Universal monsters. Made it into the park where they are welcoming the most important star of all, you. You may have noticed there's a red carpet as you walk towards the entrance. And then right once you get through the turnstiles, you've got this fountain right here with the cameraman up ahead, the boom operator right here. Very nice hair. I'd love some tips on volume. It's probably just living in California. Uh, and then you've got the director who's getting you the star in frame. I've mentioned this before, but one thing I love about this being Universal Hollywood, where a lot of these movies are made, is that all over the park, they have real props and costumes from actual movies, like this car from The Mummy, the Brendan Fraser one from 1999. And they'll rotate out things too, seasonally. So like during Halloween Horror Nights, they had actual Chucky dolls from the Chucky TV show uh, to promote Fast X last year. They had a bunch of cars from Fast and Furious. So you never know what you're gonna see. Made it into the New York section of the upper lot theme to old timey New York, but also home to the new Power Up Cafe, which is serving new Super Nintendo World Mario themed food. We are coming back here for snacks later, don't you worry, because stuff is so cute, I want to scream. But for now, I think we got to start with the most important meal of all. Breakfast acquired. Now we continue. Scoping out the signage here at the New York section. Got some citizens out too. Uh, Hello, officer. I love them. Hey, welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you. Got the right idea. Cup of coffee. Got a nice steak. Lots to have buffet. Where are you from, gorgeous? Orlando. Orlando. You got that good Orlando Hill House there. Those singers are you kidding me? Oh, the Mountain Mountain. Yes, you know. You know. Bye. So good to see you. We'll chat with the locals, and now I'm headed down towards Secret Life of Pets. When this part opened, it was called Baker Street, and it's kind of themed to London, but now there's things themed to Secret Life of Pets as well. Oh, and Scooby Dooby Doo is here. Taking a look in this bodega window in the Secret Life of Pets section, and I love looking at little products like this because a lot of them are pretty funny, like open a bottle of Beer Belly. Sorry, I got distracted by the very cute bird from Migration, which is like the cutest character being greet ever look at him. Anyway, uh, I also noticed that you've got Chihu body wash, which Chihu is like an exclamation in Hawaii when you're excited. Very similar to a hee hee uh, from Granddaddy Tsunami. And then I also noticed that a lot of these products have names on them like Laurel Vaughn ketchup and Kent's maple syrup. 
So of course I had to do a quick Google, which revealed that these are the names of some of the Universal creative team that made this attraction. Specifically, Laurel Von Ketchup is a nod to Laurel Von Patton, who was the senior designer for the ride The Secret Life of Pets. So we love when they give nods to the creative team behind the rides. And speaking of the secret life of pets off the leash, let's ride this attraction right now because it is literally so cute. I had never seen this movie and then I rode the ride and it was so cute that I had to watch it and now I realize how cute the movie is too. And this queue is full of so many cool things, including animatronics. Like here's our friend Norman the guinea pig hot wiring the uh, elevator right here. And then right over here, you've got Norman missing again. But um, I found him. How come you guys don't have collars on? Are you lost? If you need help, you are definitely talking to the wrong guy. Hilarious. Norman's like, I'm lost. And it's great that the owners have put the signs up. Also, the reason he said, hey, you don't have collars on, that's because you're a dog now. In this ride, you are a puppy up for adoption, and you're just hoping some nice humans will adopt you. But along the way, you're going to talk to the other friendly cats and dogs of the neighborhood. Hey, Gidget. Are you okay? What? What do you mean? Do you think we can need help? No, I do not need help. Here's a cool detail. You can actually look in this letter box. Letter box, not litter box. I know we're on a pet ride. There's another one. I like to think about what my dogs do when I'm not there. I don't think it's have a dance party though. Kronk's too lazy. Made it into one of the apartments. It's, it's Buddy's owner's apartment, Buddy the wiener dog. And I love that on the shelf, the owner just appreciates the, the wiener dog because he's got wiener dog dressed as Elvis. Literal wiener dog. But I like this one, the little like sheriff wiener dog. And then there's Buddy's hot dog shaped bed, adorable. For obvious reasons, I, I've never owned a wiener dog. <laughs> but I do think they're cute. We made it to Duke and Max's house. And you know this because they've got the blocks. Hi, Norman. All right, I'm gonna go see what's going on next door. There's a bunny rabbit who thinks he's a superhero. Can you imagine? Anyway, more, more importantly, I think, than the Duke and Max blocks is this. Mammoth Club Easter egg. So. No homes? No owners? Well, who feeds them? Who rubs their bellies, Max? Who throws a ball and then waits for them to get it and then throws it again? I mean, no one. They're strays. That is so sad. In Katie's living room with Max and Duke, that, that's the main dogs from the story, and uh, looking at her bookshelf and a couple of very funny books, What to Expect When You're Expecting a Ride, and the little icon here is a cardboard box because the ride vehicles on this attraction are cardboard boxes. And if you look the author of the book, and it's written by Noseworthy, which from a quick LinkedIn search is <laughs> seems to be a nod to Jane Noseworthy, who at the time was the manager here when this ride opened, but now she's the senior manager of attraction operations on the lower lot so good for you Jane and then I also noticed this one right here a beginner's guide to ride systems and it was written by John Erguin and he's the senior director of rides and shows at Universal Studios Hollywood very cool and then you've also got the Soup Lover's Guide to Canada by Sandy Kent. Sandy Kent is a uh, project director at Universal Creative, and he also actually had an ingredient or a, a product outside of the bodega. So Sandy gets two Easter eggs for his work on this ride. And then lastly, I'm looking at all the white ones because those are the ones that have the Easter eggs on them. You've got Know Your Fur, the complete guide to pet grooming by someone named Riccio. And that seems to be Christine Riccio, who's a figure finisher here at Universal. So like on animatronics and different things on the set, which is funny because if she's the figure finisher, she would likely be doing things like the fur and the accents onto the animatronics. All right, Max and Duke told us to find Captain Snowball. Not in this apartment. Oh, I think we found him. It's just in the bedroom. All right, keep it moving. You in the back, why are you moving so slow? <laughs> Use that puppy energy. Move it. Move it. Hey, you over there. Yeah. Why are you so nervous? You need to be walked. What? <laughs> Welcome to the secret headquarters of Captain Snowball. Now, I know it looks like a typical little kid's room, but that's just because it provides the perfect cover for my superhero activities. I was really sad because Duke realized 
what stray dogs are like, what their lives are like. And I got really sad. Um, but then Captain Snowball made me happier because he, one, drew a beautiful abstract map for the city and it makes me LOL. And two, he, you know, helped fight toxic masculinity, which I appreciate. Because Molly's going to be home like an hour. We're supposed to have a tea party. Now, I know it's thinking, but there ain't nothing wrong with the grown buddy having a tea party. It's a great way to unwind after a hard day of battling the forces of evil. Uh, we also just left Molly's room. That's Snowball's human. And she has a bunch of toys out, including a minion which is one of the properties here at Universal Hollywood, just like Universal Orlando. And uh, keep your eyes filled on the ride, because I think we're going to see some more Minion notes. Uh, not all of them. <laughs> some, some of you will be okay, though. <laughs> <laughs> is just so darn cute and proof that as long as it's a well-themed and well-done dark ride with cute animatronics, I'll love it. And it's a must ride even if you've never seen the movie, but the movie is really cute. Now, a couple things I noticed on the attraction. For starters, there's a Duffy Bear, like a Disney Duffy Bear Japan in the shipping area. There's also a box that says work gear on it. And if you look at what's included, it's like overalls and goggles and boots. I wonder who those could belong to. There's also minion golf covers on some golf clubs. And then as you're scooting along through some very cute scenes, like one of my favorites are the uh, is the yoga downward dog studio and there's a dog outside doing yoga with the people inside. You've also had Snowball saying things like, don't worry, I'll be on the lookout for danger, nothing will get past me. And if you look in the background in a window, there are the evil cats like coming behind Snowball. As you continue through, you end up in the pet shop where you're gonna get all ready for your adoption. But there are some different pet products, including those backpacks that you can carry your cat in. Some of them are shaped like minions. And then at the very end, after you've been adopted and you're at the party thrown for you by the different pets, you've got Mel the Pug. Mel the Pug is a character in the Secret Life of Pets movies, and then it's also the name of a minion in Despicable Me 3, which came out the year later. Mel the Pug in the movie wears a minion outfit, so they named the minion after him, and in the ride, he's wearing the minion outfit. Also, you get adopted by a family, and I got adopted by a family with two moms, and I got really excited because I love that Universal included that and uh, a wide array of different families that could adopt you the pet because I just think that's nice. Anyway, uh, what a great ride, and I hear Snowball the Rabbit out now, so let's go say hi. Hello, hello. Hi, hi. <laughs> oh, there's a dragon, everybody. Rawr. Rawr, rawr. There's a turtle dragon. <laughs> oh, he got a baby, everybody. Shh. The baby sleeping. <laughs> the baby is asleep. I'm good. How are you, Snowball? I'm doing amazing. <laughs> I'm having a great Monday. Yeah? Yeah, I have my morning carrots. Me and Molly did our morning routine. I sent her off to school. Yeah? Yep, and then I worked out. Can you tell? I Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. You see, my, my, my fur is brushed, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I look great. My name is also Molly. You, you what? My name's also Molly. What? Yeah. You know Molly's like my favorite person. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Molly, you have a great time, okay? Thanks, Snowball. I'll see you later. Bye. Snowball is so fun. Now, speaking of the minions, let's head over towards Gru's house in Minion Mayhem. But before we get there, we got to stop by this window right here, the bike shop, because you are going to see that their security sticker says they're protected by Cyberdyne. That is a nod to the now extinct Terminator themed attraction T23D. It used to live right here. And if you're familiar with Terminator, you know that the company behind it was Cyberdyne Systems. So that's a fun little Easter egg to an attraction of the past. Also, it says 1984 because that's when the Terminator movie came out. I'll be back. Except I won't. Except for maybe I will to ride pets again because I really do love that attraction. But for now, we're headed towards Gru's house where he plans to steal the moon and we're gonna go ring some doorbells. All of the houses right here in Gru's neighborhood have doorbells, and I was told by the internet to ring them, so I will. 
This person looks nice. <laughs> it's the minions. <laughs> is Gru's house just really big? Like, is this just all of Gru's house? <laughs> this Pharrell song for Despicable Me had no business going this hard, but it did. <laughs> I'm gonna get it, you wanna get it? I'm gonna get it. <laughs> and then right next door you've got Miss Hattie's home for girls, which has some very colorful and joyous looking kids art style artwork painted on the building, although we know inside it's a nightmare. And this is also where you can often meet the minions. And it's even cuter at Halloween time because they wear like Frankenstein outfits. LOL at the sign. Miss Hattie's Home for Girls. Orphanage founded in 1966 by Miss Hattie for the poor children of the world. This building was generously donated by the city for her exemplary and unselfish teachings. Not what I saw. Scooted over by the Kung Fu Panda Adventure, this used to be Shrek 4D, and I'm noticing a couple of cool things. Well, for starters, Donkey's about to come out and say hello. I guess I should say hi. I'd be rude not to if he's here. What's up, girl? How are you? I'm doing good. What's up, Dan? This guy... Okay, now I'm not taking offense that I that I get the cell phone and not the good camera. That's okay. No, this, that's this one is so I can hear you better. Oh, that's it. You'd hear me better. Okay, yeah. this guy, well, you got like a microphone on top of the other one. Though. This, <laughs> this kinda, I'm just saying this. Uh -huh. Okay, that's okay. Uh -huh. I don't get the good camera. If I see you using the good camera on Shrek and Fiona, I'm going to be really upset. <laughs> and I'll be like, this guy, did he, Dunkey doesn't get the good camera right there. That's, a, that's fine. That's a, what's your name? Molly. Molly. Good guy, the man's Molly. <laughs> I just met Donkey and he roasted me because I've got our big camera and like I'm cradling it like a child but I was using my phone to film Donkey and that's because the microphone on the big camera can either be set on whoever's talking or it can be facing out and I had it set on whoever's talking and I quickly was like scrambling so I just got my phone out to video Donkey uh, so that you could hear him and the mic wasn't facing the wrong way and Donkey's like oh I'm not good enough to use the good camera on <laughs> oh my gosh the biggest character I've ever seen besides Bing Bong is here hold on Po is gigantic with his giant hat. Look how cute he is. Anyway, I got distracted with how big Poe is. Anyway, Donkey, very fun. He's a delight to meet whether you're here or I'm, I'm hoping he's gonna come back to the new DreamWorks land that's opening uh, this summer at Universal Studios Florida. But one thing I noticed while I was over by Donkey is that he is at a travel agency booth. And if you look at the posters and the itineraries, you are gonna notice some familiar places if you are a fan of DreamWorks movies. So you're gonna see Far, Far Away, The Isle of Burke, which is from How to Train Your Dragon, Troll Town, which is from Trolls, very, very cute Easter egg. And then I think there's a, Speaking of the trolls, oh my god. Hi, Branch! I love you so much! I love the trolls so much. What a dream that was. Anyway, let's go look for more Shrek Easter eggs. No one tell Donkey that troll was in the good camera. All right, here in the Kung Fu Panda Adventure, which used to be Shrek, you've got your ticket taker right here. And our ticket taker is a half asleep Pinocchio but I love some of the details in here for starters he's got the Starbucks Universal Studios Hollywood mug the exclusive and if you look on his little to-do list back here he's got a sell ticket steal the all spark which is Transformers joke look into becoming a real boy hilarious lunch in the Great Hall which is Wizarding World things real boys do do not tell lies and therapy all good advice dream it plan to do it he wrote in I'm a real boy He's got a, um, a note from Poe. Your edition was awesome, but your reading was a little wooden. Better luck next time, Poe. And then he's got a tree service uh, business card here. And then he's also got a sign that he's not allowed to take checks from the following people. You've got characters from Shrek, like Donkey, Gingy, and Lord Farquaad. You've got Emotep, who's the villain on the uh, Revenge of the Mummy. And then you've got some more uh, little obscure ones. You've got Woody Woodpecker, you've got Rumpelstiltskin, and then if you 
keep reading and looking into them all, you've got a few more kind of obscure ones or funny jokes like termites. Well, he's made of wood, so that would be bad. You've got Chantel Dudois, who's the villain in Madagascar 3. You've got Pretarius Oswald, who's the mad scientist who uh, convinces Frankenstein to continue with his creation of the monster. You've got Lord Shen, who's the villain in Kung Fu Panda 2, and Tai Lung, who's the villain in Kung Fu Panda 1. You've got Drago Bloodfist, who is the villain in How to Train Your Dragon 2. But I think the best jokes on here are Any Whales, which is a, a nod to Pinocchio, and an even more niche nod to Pinocchio is El Terrible Pescacane, which translates uh, in Italian to The Terrible Dogfish, which in the 1883 Adventures of Pinocchio, that is the final antagonist. That is the, uh, the fish that goes after Pinocchio. So really funny and detailed Easter eggs all on this sign right here. Kung Fu Panda Adventure is not my favorite. It's probably my least favorite attraction in the park just because I'm not attached to that IP. And it's not as fun, I think, as like Shrek 4D, but I really like that Pinocchio Easter egg. And now before we go much further into the park, before we get to Wizarding World and Simpsons and Jurassic Park, we're going to go to the newly refurbished little snack area that's got the new Super Mario food because I'm hungry and I think I need to power up. I think adding the Power Up Cafe was smart because it feels like it was definitely in response to how popular Toadstool Cafe is down in Super Nintendo World, which often uses a virtual queue and can sell out of spots for the whole day. So it's fun that you can still get Super Mario food and Super Nintendo food here up in the upper lot. And also they're different food from down there so that if you want to return or try more Mario food, you can do that too. They have a huge menu here, but a really cute menu. They've got two different mushroom calzones, the super mushroom calzone, which is basically pepperoni pizza, and the one-up mushroom calzone, which is a plant-based calzone. They've got a pretzel shaped like the flower. They've got glittery popcorn, some of the souvenir collectibles here, like the popcorn bucket and sippers. And then they're also known for their drinks because they have these cute little uh, sugar cube things that once you drop them into your beverage, they change the flavor and color. All right, picked up some goodies, and look how cute even the packaging is. I went with the One Up Mushroom Fizz, which is lemon lime soda with green apple popping pearls and a lime One Up Mushroom Power Up, which is in that little box. I asked the team member, they said that was the least sweet of them. I also got the Super Mushroom Calzone, which is a mushroom shaped calzone filled with pepperoni sausage, mozzarella, and tomato sauce. And then I couldn't resist the Fire Flower Pretzel because one, it's adorable, and two, it comes with three different dipping sauces, a mustard, a chipotle, cheese and a white queso and I'm a sucker for a dipping sauce. All right here is my power up. First of all look at the little cube. Is that not the cutest thing you've ever seen? And then I'm gonna plop it into my drink and spin and it's gonna change the color of the drink. Plop. It's fizzing. It is certainly fizzing. Oh my gosh it's green. Oh no. Oh no disaster. There we go. Problem solved and look how cute. All right. Let's try this food. First of all, I got my One Up Power Fizz. It did kind of overflow, so get napkins if you're gonna make one of these. Yeah, that mostly tastes like Sprite because it was lemon lime to begin with and then the Power Up itself was lime, so it just tastes like Sprite. But I think these are really fun and I think the little sugar things are adorable, so I would not knock these at all. In fact, if you've got people in your group that like sweeter flavors, I would try the other ones, but this is adorable. Now let's try the calzone now. Ben Wyatt would love this. I feel bad doing this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna break him in half. Right. Right. Oh. oh. Hi Shrek! Hi Fiona! Are there any slugs in that? No! I'm sorry! <laughs> Alright, now let's try the calzone. I'm pleasantly surprised. I thought this would taste meh. Now, it's not the best thing I've ever had, but it's definitely better than meh. The filling is really good. It's really cheesy. Not a super strong pepperoni flavor. I'm tasting a little bit more of the sausage and the marinara sauce, but the, it actually tastes like good sauce. It's got good herbs going on. I like the extra cheese on the outside from the little spots on the shell. That's pretty good. It's more like kind of lasagna-y. I don't know, but it, it's much better than I expected it to be. I would definitely eat that again. And now the pretzel, which I think the pretzel itself, while very cute, is just gonna taste like a pretzel. I'm really here for the dipping situation. It's ripping weird. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of the pretzel by itself. Because of its shape, it's not really fluffy. Like I want a big, like fluffy, bouncy, 
pretzel, and it's it's not that because it's in this cute shape. But let's try it with the sauces, shall we? First up, mustard. Which I do think is the most boring sauce, but we're gonna work our way up in my level of excitement. But it tastes like a pretzel with mustard. Next up, the chipotle cheese. Mm. That's really good, actually. The sauce. It's actually got a little bit of heat. It's got a lot of smoky flavor, which I think is kind of what they're translating the chipotle as. That's delicious, and I'm definitely gonna dip my calzone into it. And lastly, the queso, which appears to actually have some jalapenos in it, which is how I prefer queso. Yeah, it's actually pretty good white queso. Shockingly though, I think I like the chipotle a little bit better. I don't love the pretzel, but the dips are really good, so I've got a 50-50 on this one. What I would definitely get again is the calzone, and I think this is fun to try with a couple different people to share to try the different sauces, but the calzones delighted me. Overall though, very cute. The calzone into the chipotle cheese, that's the move right there. Snack complete, and we are moving our way into the wizarding world of Harry Potter, which is Hogsmeade here. Now this Hogsmeade is almost the exact same as the one in Universal Islands of Adventure in Florida. Uh, they don't have Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure TM, and the, some of the spells are different. Um, however, they've got the three broomsticks, the hog's head, the same shops for the most part, Harry Potter and their Forbidden Journey inside Hogwarts, and Flight of the Hippogriff. Because it's so similar to the Wizarding World in Florida, we're not gonna be spending too much time here today, even though I have an undying love for Harry Potter, just because it is very similar. They have a lot of the same Easter eggs and details to look for, um, which I've done lots of videos out in Florida. Like I did a video with over a hundred different details to look for in Wizarding World out there. Um, but I am gonna point out a few that are different here. Also, obviously not an Easter egg, but it's just so weird to round the corner right here and not see Hagrid's. Like, it's just a door. It's actually a spell. It's a good It's a good spell if you've brought your wand. First up, we're in Honeydukes. I was actually trying to get into Zonko's, which is the joke shop that they no longer have in Florida. They expanded Honeydukes, the candy shop there. But unfortunately, Zonko's is leaving here too. Zonko's is the joke shop here in Hogsmeade. And up on the shelves, they were selling the portable swamp, which is a nod to the portable swamps that Fred and George use on their retaliation against Umbridge in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. I love that detail. And I love in the story when it says that Flitwick saves just a little bit of the swamp and robes it off forever because he says it's a really good piece of magic. But the witch just told me the reason that they're closing Zonko's here is to make room for Florian Fortescue's The Ice Cream Parlor, which they're adding here. It's gonna have a Hogsmeade branch, so that's pretty exciting. Anyway, uh, I was looking about and I noticed these bottles right here for George Rumsey's Wizard Brew. So that is what the bottle looks like for the Wizard Brew exclusive beer that you can get in the Wizarding World. And it says it's the official sponsor of the Quidditch World Cup. You've also got Simison Steaming Stout, which has a train on it and makes an appearance in the Harry Potter and Prisoner of Azkaban movie. And because it's a wizard beer and it says steaming with the train, you can imagine that if you were to drink this, some kind of cool effect might happen, like it might actually steam like an engine. Also, according to the internet, the phrase steaming is British slang for being really, really intoxicated. So maybe someone can confirm if that's true or not, but if so, that's a good pun on the bottle. Making my way into the Three Broomsticks, which is the restaurant here in Hogsmeade, to see if they have an Easter egg that used to exist in Orlando and then disappeared. Well, I didn't spot the one I was looking for. They used to have shadows of the house elves working up in the rafters at the Three Broomsticks in Orlando, and it's gone now, and I don't spot it here either. But I did spot the actual Three Broomsticks, which this restaurant is named after. And whenever I think about that, I think about Madame Rose Murda fetching broomsticks for Harry and Dumbledore in uh, Half-Blood Prince once they return back from the cave before going to Dumbledore's um, chat with Snape. Also, just looking in here is amazing as far as detail goes. If you look up in the rafters, first of all, this is a very, very tall building and uh, it really does look like it's been here for decades and decades. And it's got old trunks and brooms and lanterns and it, I mean, it's really a feat of creativity in here. Picked up a Bung Barrels Spiced Mead from the Hogshead. This is a fermented honey wine that is served cool during this time of year, but during the winter time, they also serve it warm. We don't have this drink in Orlando for some reason, so uh, I always get one on I'm here. Cheers. It's so good. You can definitely taste the honey. Kind of reminds me more of a cider than an actual wine because it does have a little bit of bubble in it because of the fermentation. Not sweet. Delicious. 
another little detail. I believe I pointed this one out before, but you know, when in Hogsmeade, you've got a mandrake right here in the window of Dogweed and Deathcap. And if you remember from Chamber of Secrets, you know their cry is very loud and you need protection. And uh, don't worry, we got you covered right here. Right here at the Owl Post is probably the most just, wow, do they pay attention to the detail. You may notice there's some owls up there, a couple throughout the rafters here at the Owl Post, you know, maybe just waiting to do some mail delivery. And you'll notice on their perch, you know, they're owls, they're birds, they do their stuff wherever they want it to, and it drips down all the way down to the floor. Yeah, those are fake owl poops. That Universal Creative, look. I can't get rid of it. That's a fake owl poop because Universal Creative was like, when we do it, we do it. It's really cool to sit and watch the owls for a moment too, because they actually move, they'll blink, they'll turn their heads, some will flap their wings. And then there's another fun detail right over this way. We have this in Orlando too, but uh, it's always good to point out that if you come behind Owl Post, you can see a howler and hear some different complaints and people getting yelled at. Popped into Glad Rags Wizarding Wear to show a few more things that we don't have. We do not have Ginny's dress up here for the Yule Ball. We do not have Floor's dress from the Yule Ball in Florida or Cho's, which is right here. And the reason this one's behind glass is because this one was actually the one worn in the movies. Also right here is Molly Weasley's crochet that you can see when uh, the Harry first visits the borough. We actually do have this in Orlando in Diagon Alley and it actually moves. The mirror is here too. She's in a different location though. The well-dressed witch or wizard needs a robe for every occasion, I say. I agree, except for when I hear robe for every occasion, I think sweatshirt or hair accessory. Gonna walk the flight of the Hippogriff queue quickly as well. We have this attraction in Florida. It's kind of your kid's coaster, 39 inch height requirement. Not super duper intense, but it is a really cute attraction. And if you're a Harry Potter fan, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted by these mischievous little noises I hear in the forest. I don't think those Cornish pixies that Professor Lockhart released have found their way into the forest. Never heard those before. Now, as we come up onto Hagrid's cabin here, you can actually hear Fang barking, which we do have in Orlando, but you can hear Hagrid too. And because they don't have Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure TM, you can see Sirius's motorbike parked right here. And yes, I say Sirius's motorbike because Sirius had a fascination with motorcycles as a young wizard. You know that from in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows when Harry is exploring Sirius's room in Grimble Place and he sees posters and, and manuals from different motorbikes. So he enchants this one and then he eventually gives it to Hagrid to help Hagrid deliver Harry to the Dursleys when he goes after Peter Pettigrew on that faithful Halloween at night. In fact, if you go back and reread the Harry Potter series, once you know who Sirius Black is, you'll notice his name is in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. When Hagrid meets up with McGonagall and Dumbledore at Privet Drive, he says, young Sirius Black lent me his motorbike. I just love exploring the queue in Hagrid's hut because you never know what you're gonna find. He's got wood lice for bow truckles. And then over this way, he's got some more crates. Looks like the Monster Book of Monsters was supposed to be in there, but it escaped. However, if you listen closely, it sounds like there's one left. Here you've got a crate full of fire crabs, which Hagrid allegedly, you know, I don't want to condone any of his under the table business deals, but allegedly Hagrid's doing some illegal breeding and allegedly that helps lead to a blast in its group. Flight of the Hippogriff really is a cute attraction and don't recommend waiting in a long, long line either park. Uh, but if you're a Harry Potter fan, you get to see the very cool animatronic of Buckbeak and you can really only see it by being on the ride. So I recommend it for that. Next up, we're gonna head into the Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey queue, which is here at Hogwarts. I've never actually walked all the way through the queue here because I've been told the ride's the exact same and it makes me nauseous in Florida. I'm pretty sure it'll make me nauseous in California too. However, I wanna walk the queue to see if I notice any details that are not in Florida's version. 
One thing that's definitely different, although you can't really see it right now, is they do have the flying car parked over this way. There are so many iconic scenes and details and characters in this queue and this ride that if you are a Harry Potter fan, I definitely recommend riding it. But because of the very unique ride system, it makes a lot of people, myself included, very, very nauseous. Basically, you're on like an octopus arm and you're sitting on a bench and then they swing you like this and you go up and down and all around through both practical sets and screens. I think if it was all practical sets, I would be fine, but the screens kill me. That said, you see a lot of iconic things like the Forbidden Forest and the Chamber of Secrets and the Basilisk. You see Quidditch, Dragons, Acromantula. So if you're a Harry Potter fan, I recommend riding it at least once just to see it all, but maybe do it at the end of the day. So if you get sick, you don't waste the rest of your day. One thing I just noticed that I definitely don't think is in Orlando is if you listen closely at the kitchen store, you can hear the house elves cooking. I've got earmuffs with their mandrakes in the queue too. Why don't they care about ear protection in Orlando? We've got the mandrakes, but not the earmuffs. Yo, I just got in the castle. I'm looking at the statue of the architect. This is who built Hogwarts, and around the bottom of him are the four house mascots. You've got the raven for Ravenclaw, even though it should be an eagle. You've got the badger for Hufflepuff, the lion for Gryffindor, and the snake for Slytherin. But in Orlando, the snake is like so hard to see that for a while I didn't even think they had a snake. But here, he's just out and about as he should be. What is with? the anti-Slytherin agenda in Florida. I am shaken by this. Look at it, look how obviously that is a snake. Wow, wow. Made it into the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom. And one of my favorite details in this queue, and I think they're gonna have them all here too, is the fact that they hid something from every one of the Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers that Harry, Ron, and Hermione deal with. So you've got the Still dragon hanging on the ceiling. That was from Quirrell. You've got Gilderoy Lockhart's books from Gilderoy Lockhart and Chamber of Secrets. On the blackboard, you see how to cast Expecto Patronum, which is what Professor Lupin teaches Harry in three. You've also got these kind of spine candles, which are from Professor Lupin. From Professor Moody, well, Barty Crouch posing as Moody, you've got Mad-Eye Moody's walking stick. That's Goblet of Fire. From Order of the Phoenix, if you look at the textbooks on the desk, they are Dark Arts Basics for Beginners, which is what Umbridge assigns everyone. And from Snape in Half-Blood Prince, you've got the projector. Generally speaking, it seems a lot lighter in this queue, so you're actually able to see a lot of the details better. Like, our Gryffindor common room is very, very dark. It's hard to see a lot of this stuff. Like, for example, up here on this dresser, you've got the Quidditch board game, which you can actually buy, uh, but the little Quidditch tents look like they do in the film with the different house color platforms. On the desks here, you've got a chocolate frog container. But this book right here is Sub Aquatic Botanical Mysteries, which got me really excited because immediately I was like, that's the book that Moody gives Neville so that he can learn about water plants because he's so good at herbology. And then that's how he tells Harry to use gillyweed for the second task of the Triwizard Tournament in Goblet of Fire, the film. In the movie, Dobby tells him, but very, very cool. You can also much more clearly see this portrait right here, which we learned at the Harry Potter experience in Japan, is uh, designed after a young Maggie Smith who plays McGonagall. On the shelf here, you've got the radio, which is similar to the one that Harry, Ron, and Hermione use when they're on the run in Deathly Hallows to tune in to the uh, wireless, the Potter watch. You've got a filibuster's fireworks right here, and you've got Colin Creevy's camera. Oh, this queue is so cool. It had a lot of the same ones we have in Florida too, like the Mirror of Erised, Stapes Office, the One-Eyed Witch with the Hump statue, but hopefully you enjoyed seeing some ones I've not noticed or we don't have in the uh, Florida version. And after a nice whimsical time here at Wizarding World of Harry Potter, it's time to scoot on and head to our next attractions. I really do love this land so much. And whilst, yes, the ones in Florida, are bigger and double the lands and have my favorite attraction in the whole wide world. This one is lovely as well. And it's usually less crowded. And I love that there's different little Easter eggs to look for here. Made it into the Simpsons area of the park Springfield. Now, I am the first to admit, I'm not the best at Simpsons because I've never seen the show. So I'm sure that a, an avid watcher would be able to point out a bunch more Easter eggs than I am gonna be able to find. But I did look up a couple of really funny ones. For starters here at Cletus's Chicken Shack, which is a quick service restaurant, the sign didn't fully cross the road. 
bleak, but funny. I also really enjoyed this sign right here. Dr. Nix, if you can put it in, we can take it out. Unlicensed for over two decades. Also, if you look up this way, you're gonna see that Sideshow Bob is escaping from prison, which feels bad because, again, I don't know much about Sideshow Bob, but I do know he tried to kill me on the Simpsons ride, so I don't know that he should be free. But the one I'm most excited about is here at the Springfield Nuclear Power Plant. For starters, there's a great joke right here. If you look at the control panel, the person has gone fizzin instead of fission. 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 It's a, it's a science word I clearly can't say correctly. But more importantly, if you see a button, press a button. Hopefully you could hear and see that, but as soon as I pressed the button, the alarm started going off on the top of the power plant and these containers of nuclear waste, which feel like a really precarious place to put those, started shaking. I love that. Now, a couple of things to know. One, it's hard to see on the camera, but the alarms in the window actually were going off too. The red light was flashing. And two, it didn't happen every time. I did it a couple of times so I could try and get different angles of it on camera. And it would sometimes, it would take like two or three times to be hitting the button to go off. So I don't know if it's on a timer or if it just doesn't happen every time, if it's kind of like set to do it every certain number of hits. So if you come here and you try this and it doesn't go off when you hit it, hit it a couple more times. So Someone else must have just pushed the button at the nuclear power plant and the explosion and effect was even greater. I should get out of here. Headed now to the world famous Studio Tram Tour. This again was the only thing that was open when this park officially opened as a theme park in 1964. And this is an hour long attraction. Yes, you heard that right, a 60 minute attraction. Good news though, friends, you can bring drinks on board. So if you wanna grab a coffee, a soda, a beer, before you get on a tram car, you are more than welcome to do that. And this is a really fun experience because they're gonna actually take you through the active back lot where they are filming TV shows and movies right now. And some of your favorite TV shows and movies have been filmed. They're gonna point out different movie sets. They have these sets from movies like Nope, the Jordan Peele film. They've got the Down 747 from War of the Worlds, Steven Spielberg movie they have a little jaws moment which is of course my favorite part you're also going to see different vehicles used from different movies like jurassic park and this is where at this park you're going to have experiences that were the predecessor to fast and the furious supercharged and skull island reign of kong which are full attractions on their own out in universal studios florida they're actually part of the tram tour here I cannot recommend the studio tour enough. Now, I'm not gonna talk on the attraction, obviously, because that's what the tour guide is for. Uh, so we're gonna go do the attraction and then I'll share some fun facts afterwards. Tiffany, with an eye. And the greenest drive. Five. On your right-hand side, we're gonna Around the corner, you see our very own firefighters in the most beautiful Hillsdale neighborhood, town square, back alleys. They're actually setting up right now. That happened pretty incredible. That area is called Courthouse Square. That's where back to the future Here's how they use those in Bruce Almighty. How many bricks did it take to make this wall? The answer is none. Zero bricks. Now we have created this 3D. Man begs his mama to look under his bed. We don't work for nobody. 
Finished up the tram tour. I really do think that's a must do while you're here. I mean, so unique to Universal Studios Hollywood compared to any other theme park in the US. And you're gonna absolutely see something from a movie or a TV show you've seen, whether it be Nope or War of the Worlds or Desperate Housewives or Jurassic Park or Back to the Future. Like you're gonna see something from a movie you've seen or a TV show you've seen, which is just really, really cool. Also, it has the potential to be different every time you ride it. Like for example, the last few times I've ridden it, we were not allowed to go down into one area um, that kind of looks like New York, General City, kind of area because they were filming things and we were allowed to go down there today and that was part of where they filmed Back to the Future. So there's just cool things like that. If you are at all interested in movies and television, absolutely a must ride. Also shout out to Tiffany with an I who was my driver today. She was very funny. At one point as we were in the Nope set, which is Jordan Peele's Nope, uh, she said, wow, this is scary. I think it's time for us to get out. And no one laughed, but I laughed because that's Jordan Peele's other two movies. So good job, Tiffany, if you for some reason are watching this, which you're probably not, but you are fabulous. Also, the Fast and Furious part, it's very similar to Fast and Furious Supercharged in Orlando, which I love even though most people hate because I, unironically, uh, as does Max, very much love the family, love Fast and the Furious. Max is the reason I'm into that franchise. But the things that Dwayne The Rock Johnson, AKA Hobbs says on this one that he doesn't say in Florida are so funny. He's like, I'm the reason the boogeyman tells his mom to check his bed before he goes to sleep. So silly, so silly, I laugh out loud, it's delightful. Now the tram tour itself is just basically a giant Easter eggs history tour where they're gonna teach you so many, so many things. That's why the guides are amazing. But a couple of extra things that I found out while I was researching this video. Number one, right after you visit my favorite part of the tour, Amity, where you get to see Bruce the shark, look to the left-hand side and there's another street that kind of winds down. You do not go down the street on the tour because it is not wide enough for the trams to be able to turn around. It's actually called Elm Street and Universal bought the houses along the street for $1 because they were clearing up the neighborhood to make way for the original Dodger Stadium. So Universal was like, we will give you $1, Bob, and they got all those houses. Since they purchased it, a lot of notable films and TV have been filmed on that street. Those include Monk, Hancock, The Hulk, and most famously, To Kill a Mockingbird. Also speaking of the Jaws section in Amity, my favorite part, because it's my favorite movie of all time, the orca, the ship from the movie, actually used to sit in that lagoon. And then sometime in the 90s, they um, chopped it up for timber wood. Are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Chopped the orca up in the early 90s? The orca, the ship, Quince boat, you chopped it up. And uh, you know what, it's not just me that was mad. Director Steven Spielberg was mad because he went on the tram tour and was like, where's the orca? And then found out the horrible fate of it and then got mad. Correct, Steven. I can't, why? I would have bought it. It could have lived in my house. Where? I don't know, but it could have. And speaking of disaster, this is actually a little bit more serious, but there have been several fires here on the back lot, the biggest of which was in 2008. It was a three alarm fire and it burned down the original King Kong encounter. Now legend has it that some of the ashes from King Kong were collected and sit in the team member break room to this day. If you're a team member can confirm this, please let me know. But in addition to losing the King Kong encounter, the fire also deleted somewhere between 40 and 50,000 archived digital film and video copies, and somewhere between 118 and 175,000 master copies of uh, music from Universal Music Group. So this included the master tapes, the original recordings from artists such as Aerosmith, Louis Armstrong, Mary J. Blige, Jimmy Buffett, The Eagles, Elton John, and Dolly Parton. So this was absolutely a horrible situation that happened in 2008, um, but it, it took King Kong counter took a bunch of music and it took a bunch of original filming as well. And what caused this whole fire? Roofers retiring the roof. Luckily though, while there were some minor injuries, no one was seriously hurt and no one died from the fire, which is why I will discuss it with you. But that is a piece of history that happened right here at Universal. But now with the tram tour under our belt, we are headed down to the lower lot to check out the final few areas of the park I wanna talk about. But seriously, how cool is it that you get to go on a tram tour through actual studios, historic studios under 100 years old, some of those places, and uh, learn about the history of film? I just think that attraction is so cool, so unique, just like the rest of this park, because you literally are in the Hollywood Hills. 
made it down to the lower lot and this is home to Jurassic World, Super Nintendo World, The Mummy, and Transformers The Ride 3D. I'm telling you, I'll never get used to the fact that you've got to ride 80s mall escalators down to get to the lower lot down here. Well, we've got a couple of things to check out, including my favorite ride in the park. But first, let's go to Super Nintendo World. The newest area here at Universal Studios Hollywood, very, very popular, often uses a virtual queue just to access the lands, but I'm coming later in the afternoon on a weekday, so I didn't need to do that. Super Nintendo World starts with a jump into the warp pipe here as you head into the incredibly themed land. You're gonna be immersed with the noises that you're familiar with from all the games. And there's a really cool Easter egg right in this very part at the beginning in Peach's Castle that I didn't even notice the first time because I was too busy getting excited about walking into the land. If you stand here and watch the portraits change in Princess Peach's castle, you'll notice that the original two portraits on each side are showing Princess Peach and Bowser Jr. and the Golden Mushroom, which sets you up for the story of Super Nintendo World, where you are uh, playing mini games to try and get into Bowser Jr.'s castle. But if you continue watching, you'll notice the portrait on the left has bob and the portrait on the right gets Goombas. These are a nod to Super Mario 64 and the levels bob Battlefield and Tiny Huge Island where you battle bob and Goombas respectively. Additionally, they're using the ripple effect when changing portraits, which is also used in Super Mario 64. Now this land is incredibly immersive. The entire thing is just details to look at. It's incredibly kinetic, so when you look up at the levels, you're gonna see mushrooms and flowers and Yoshis and Goombas moving about, coins moving about. So there is so much to look at for her in just the details. Like look at that shell spinning right there. Look at this Goomba right here at the top. Look at the coin spinning over the top, the Yoshi up there, the Goomba, like it is mind blowing how detailed this land is. But a couple of more specific things to look for. For starters, you might find the Pikmin kind of hiding around Super Nintendo World. You've got it right here trying to steal a coin. And my favorite thing about this land, besides just how incredibly immersive and detailed it is, is how much fun it is to explore. A lot of times in theme park lands, you see something and it's a facade. You can't actually get up there. But a lot of the spaces in Super Nintendo World, you can actually go up to if you know where to go. So for example, there's a thwomp right here in a cave. Let's go check it out. Also, interestingly, the thwomp, when it slammed down, used to make like kind of a sand effect happen, but now it lights that up. It doesn't do the kind of misty effect to look like it landed on sand. But we're on a mission in here for something. You see, one of the things about Super Nintendo World is if you get a power-up band, which does cost extra, you can figure out new secrets and collect coins. And one of the coolest the secrets that you can collect within the Universal app are the 8-bit characters. Now we found all of these in our Super Nintendo video when the park first opened, but here's one right here. Just look for that M, I'm gonna tap my band to it. Who is it? Ah, 8-bit Bowser! There's multiple 8-bit characters to collect, plus if you continued further in that cave, you'd find one of the mini games. Now there are four mini games throughout the land. There's the one in the cave. There's a spinning one over when you first walk in. There's the clock one, that's my favorite. And then there's the POW blocks over here with the spinning shell. If you complete three of the games, you get to go into Bowser Jr.'s castle to battle Bowser Jr. Now you can only do this if you have a Mario Power Up band, but it does add a little excitement to the land to know that you're working towards an ultimate goal. Plus Universal took it a step further and if you've already played the game, it's harder the next time you play it. I absolutely love the gamification of this land because they're also always updating the app with new challenges, new different things, new stickers to collect, which makes it fun to return to it time and time again. I'm super excited for this to come to Epic Universe in Florida next year. They're bringing Super Nintendo World to us, which means that I'm gonna be trying to collect all them coins. But back to what I was talking about when I said exploring. If you come over here by Bowser Jr. Castle, pop in this stairwell right here. There's just an arrow. Where are we going? I don't know. And yes. Good news, there is an elevator to get up here. But we have found ourselves in Glacier Path. And you can hear the winds whipping. It's cooler up here. Maybe that's just my imagination. And there's extra blocks to get. Hooray! But the coolest part of being up here, look at this view. But I just love that up here on Frosted Glacier Path, which most people aren't even gonna discover. They're not even gonna know to come up here. I love that it's covered in snow. And by that, I mean the POW blocks are covered in snow. Or the coin blocks, the question mark blocks. Got some coins. And hello, little guy. 
And then I also love the binoculars up here, which are designed to look like the binoculars from Super Mario 3D Land. If you look in them, you're gonna see Super Nintendo World, but it's gonna be augmented reality. So you're gonna see additional things flying around and moving around and use those zoom features because you might be able to unlock some different scenes. Also, more Pikmin. Last thing while we're up here before I freeze, 8-Bit Luigi. Now, of course, the crown jewel of Super Nintendo World is a Mario Kart Bowser's Challenge, which is an augmented reality shooter game that puts you into the famous Mario Kart. It has a 40-inch high requirement, and right now it only has a 15-minute wait. I think I'm living in augmented reality right now. Um, but we're gonna obviously do this because there's some cool Easter eggs in the queue. One thing I love in the queue is that throughout this first part, you do have a nod to Yoshi's Adventure, which is a slow-moving dark ride at Universal Japan, their Super Nintendo World. Um, that's the original one, but unfortunately they didn't have enough space in this one to build it. It is coming to Orlando though, but you kind of have a nod and a feel of the Yoshi ride as you go through this first part of the queue. Now I am going through single rider just because even though it's a short wait, they said it would be even shorter and we don't have too much time of park time left. And I still wanna get through a few more things, but the team member said it didn't cut off too much and I should still be able to see some of the cool Easter eggs. Whoa, okay, normally you'd go in through Bowser's mouth, which is very cool. There's a cool Bowser statue greeting you, but I'm being sent this way. Now, obviously if you've never ridden this and it's a 15 minute wait, go through the regular queue because it is awesome. But we're on an adventure together right now. Oh my god! Come on! <laughs> the most unbelievable ride. Like, the technology blows my mind. It's big practical sets, but it's also augmented reality. Like at one point you're using the hang gliders like you do in the Mario Kart games, and I looked over and the other car, like full of guests, they had augmented reality, the hand glider onto it. It's amazing. But I am gonna respectfully disagree with the team member who told me that single rider doesn't cut up that much of the queue because you do miss a lot of the queue. So if you've never been on it or it doesn't have too long of a wait, I definitely recommend going in through the regular queue. Not only do you miss the pre-show where they actually tell you how to play and set up the race that you are on Team Mario, you're fighting against Team Bowser and you're supposed to hit them with your shells, but you miss a lot of those cool details. We have lots of footage though, so let me just say real quick, my favorite of those details, besides just the sheer scale of Bowser's castle, like looking at the size of like the chains and the portraits and the big Bowser statue, I love Bowser's workshop because he's got blueprints and he's got books that are hilarious. Like he's got blueprints for bob bombs and bullet bills and his airship, but also the book titles are really funny. They're like the care and keeping of the piranha plants. They're about bob bombs. They're about different Mario references. So make sure when you go through there that you take a read at the books. I would go through the queue again, but we have less than an hour of park time left and two more rides to get through. Lucky for me, it's not super, super busy and I have Express Pass now with my annual pass, but Honestly, it's not busy at all right now. If Mario Kart is a 15 minute wait, which is shocking, nothing will have a wait. But if you wanna know more about Super Nintendo World, we did a whole video as a trio when it opened and it's really fun because Max and Alan grew up playing these games much more than I did and their excitement is just a joy to watch. Wow. Gonna pop on to a Revenge of the Mummy, the ride. This is very similar to the one in Universal Studios Florida. However, it kind of ditches the Brendan Fraser mummy set theme and it's just all about the curse of Emotep and the ancient Egyptian mummy curse. It has a 48 inch height requirement and just like the one in Universal Studios Florida, you have to put your items in a locker. So I'm gonna throw my camera in there and I don't think I'm allowed to film on the ride, but the detail I wanna look for is really fun. Very similar to its sister attraction at Universal Studios Florida, it pays homage to the attraction that used to sit in this building, which in this case was the E.T. Adventure. 
So in the Golden Idol room on the right hand side, it's hard to spot, but there's actually a little golden stuffed ET. And I'm gonna see if I can find him. is so much fun. It's a roller coaster in the dark. I do think Universal Orlando's is better because it's got the thematic like team member elements to it. And of course it's got Brendan Fraser demanding his cup of coffee at the end. This one doesn't. Um, but this one's I think darker and there's some more like blue, like whooshes. I don't know, maybe I'm just not as used to it, but I do love that attraction. I don't love that in the bug room and this one only do things tickle your feet. Don't care for that. But I did see the ET. He's on the right hand side, like up on the top of a shelf in the idle room. Hard to spot, but a very cool Easter egg. I also noticed that the vehicles are all marked with UC and Sons, which I believe to be a nod to Universal Creative, which is like their version of Imagineering that thinks up all of this genius stuff. We've got one more section of the park left to explore, and that is Jurassic World. It's actually home to my favorite attraction in the park, Jurassic World the Ride. And yes, it's a water ride, and yes, it's somehow still my favorite. That's how good it is. Several years ago here, they converted their Jurassic Park water ride into Jurassic World, and they added some scenes and characters from the newer films, including an incredible animatronic of the Indominus Rex. It's absolutely amazing. And because of that, it's my favorite attraction in the park. And seriously, it's a water ride and you actually get like decently wet and I'm still obsessed with it. That's how amazing it is. It has a 42 inch height requirement and there's not a ton of Easter eggs to look for on the ride, but we're gonna ride it to double check, I guess. But first, we're gonna head to the dino play area because this is like a dinosaur themed playground for kids. And I'm gonna just pop through here for a minute and see if I can spot anything cool. Okay, mostly it is just a really cool themed kids play area. You've got these raptor claws right here with in-gen artifact tags on them. You've got a little paleontology kit here. You've got things like binoculars everywhere. Where are we gonna see? Oh, stegosaurus in there. Eggs right here. It is really cool. So if you've got a dinosaur loving kid, come in here. But the coolest thing I found were these little like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The coolest thing I found were these little like, music chimes so that if you play the order that they tell you to, it plays the Jurassic Park theme song. Field recording. Fun fact, did you know that some of the dinosaur sounds were made by turtles uh, making more turtles? They also used horses. Jack Russell's goats. I'm also impressed by this wall right here with the like measuring chart because it really puts into scale how big a T-Rex would be. Nightmare! Anyway, I'm gonna get out of here because I don't have a kid and it's weird. So uh, let's go do Jurassic World the ride. One thing you can listen for are nods to some of the characters you may know here in the pre-show area. You will see Here's Claire Daring and Owen Grady being interviewed. But then if you also listen to people, they'll talk about like John Hammond. It's just so amazing. I love it so much. 
It, that Indominus Rex at the end is incredible. It, it sometimes has technical difficulties, but when it works, it is mind blowing. And there aren't a ton of like Easter eggs per se on the attraction. There are cool things to look for. I love the big claw marks that the Indominus Rex has left. I love the two commies fighting over a bucket hat. On the original version of this attraction, they were fighting over a Mickey ears hat, which I think is funnier and which they had left in. Another cool thing is you can notice that things are not going well in the Tyrannosaurus Kingdom room because one, there's claw marks on the wall leading into there, as well as the Jurassic Park logo sign is hanging by one chain because clearly something too big has walked into this building. There's also a Barbasol can you can spot on the first attraction which I didn't spot on this one um, but this attraction is so incredibly amazing one thing I thought that was very interesting was that as you're going up the lift into the T-Rex predator area is that some of the screens have been taken over by Owen and Claire telling you like watch out but some of the screens are still displaying fun facts about T-Rexes because if the attraction hadn't gone horribly wrong you still would have gone in there and seen the T-Rexes additionally I do think it's interesting that they've chosen to make the Jurassic Park rides at both parks a boat ride versus a Jeep ride Jeep rides are what you see in the movie obviously everyone's seen the movie but a boat ride is actually what happens in the book so I think it's interesting that they went with the book version and I've read that's because they said nothing they could do would come close to Steven Spielberg's movie so they decided to make it a little bit differently so that every guest writing it wasn't immediately comparing it to the film. I did see some cool props from the movies in the gift shop and I believe those to be different props than the last time I was here. Look how fun this is. You've got the kids wristbands from Jurassic World and you've got dinosaur eggs and raptor claws from Jurassic Park. You've got some of the paperwork from Lost World, including Eddie's uh, bio right here, his kind of resume. Uh, this one's fun. It's just the chunk of Indominus Rex that we see in Jurassic World. And then you got some more eggs down here. Well, friends, that is a wrap on our secrets video here at Universal Studios Hollywood. I hope you had fun following along. This park is a little bit different than the Universal's out in Orlando, but I think it's charming nonetheless. And I really like some of their unique attractions like Jurassic World, obviously Super Nintendo World, Super Life of Pets, and of course, the Studio Tram Tour. So let me know which one of these secrets is your favorite. Let me know if you're coming to Universal Hollywood anytime soon. Check out our other secrets videos Videos, including the Wizarding World over at Universal Orlando, their Secrets of Islands of Adventure of Universal Studios. We got Disney versions of this. And in the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, follow us on social media, come hang out with the Man Fame and Discord. And until next time, friends, I'm Molly, and it's been so magical. I'm gonna go ride Jurassic World again. Bye.